Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. I'm so excited to see you all here. So in today's video, we'll talk about detecting doublets in single cell RNA sequencing data in R using doublet finder. Before we go into the details of how doublets are identified and filtered out, it is important for us to understand what are doublets and how they are formed. So in a droplet based single cell RNA sequencing, we have cells flowing through one channel and we have microparticle beads or gel beads flowing through the another channel. So these gel beads are coated with oligonucleotides, UMIs, barcodes and a PCR primer. So they are separated into uh, separate encapsulations or droplets uh, by a partitioning oil and essentially what we get is a droplet or an encapsulation that consists of the gel beads and a cell. Later on the cells are lysed and the mRNA from the cells hybridized with the oligonucleotides present on the surface of the gel beads. This hybridized mRNA is amplified using PCR and that's how we get gene quantifications for each cell. But sometimes it so happens that there are multiple cells encapsulated in a droplet with a gel bead. And essentially this is what we refer to as doublets and these are considered as technical artifacts which need to be filtered out. Having them in the data can lead to false inferences and hence we need to filter them out before we further move on to downstream processing. There are two types of doublets, homotypic doublets and heterotypic doublets. Homotypic doublets are those that are derived from transcriptionally similar cells and heterotypic doublets are those that are derived from transcriptionally distinct cells. It is important for us to know this because uh, doublet finder is more sensitive to heterotypic doublets and it is less sensitive to detecting homotypic doublets. Talking about the doublet finder algorithm, it basically needs three parameters to make doublet predictions. It requires the number of artificial doublets, it requires a neighborhood size, which is used to compute the number of artificial nearest neighbors, and it needs the number of expected real doublets. For example, if we have a data set of 15,000 cells, a PN of 0.25 or 25% means 5,000 artificial doublets, and a PK of 0.01 meaning the neighborhood size of 200 cells. So now we'll talk about how doublet finder works using the parameters that we spoke about in the previous slide and use those parameters to predict doublets. So doublet finder workflow can be broken down into five steps. As the first step uh, of doublet finder, it simulates artificial doublets uh, from existing data by averaging the gene expression profiles of random pairs of cells and it introduces some proportion of artificial doublets into our data set. Now that proportion is the PN parameter. The authors of this uh, tool have found that uh, the performance of doublet finder is not dependent on the PN parameter and hence they have set the default value as 0.25 or 25%. In the next step, the artificial doublets are merged with the real data set and uh, standard pre-processing steps are followed. Then a linear dimensionality reduction is performed on the merged uh, artificial and real data and what we get essentially is a PCA space where the artificial doublets seem to co-localize based on similarity with the real cells. Next it detects the uh, nearest neighbors for each cell in the principal component and computes the proportion of artificial nearest neighbors. Now this step is highly dependent on the PK parameter. PK is the neighborhood size and it is found that the doublet finder performance is highly dependent on the PK parameter. So it's essential for us to uh, find the optimal PK value and use that to identify the proportions of nearest uh, artificial nearest neighbors for each cell. And in the last step, the proportion of artificial nearest neighbors that is identified for each cell is thresholded using the total number of expected doublets and is used to predict the real doublets. So there are different strategies to find the optimal PK value and that would depend on whether your data has ground truth labels. Now ground truth labels are doublet labels that are empirically defined from sample multiplexing approaches. If your uh, data set has no such uh, ground truth labels, then there are different strategies to find the optimal PK value. So depending on whether that uh, data or information is present uh, in your single cell uh, data, you can choose the strategy to find the uh, optimal PK value. So far, we've spoken about the PN and the PK parameter out of the three parameters of doublet finder. Now talking about the third parameter, which is the expected number of real doublets, we can get this information from the user guide of reagent kits from 10x genomics. So depending on the total number of cells loaded and the total number of cells recovered, we can get the uh, percentage of the doublets expected to be found. 
in case if you do not have information for the total number of cells loaded depending on the total number of cells recovered in your data uh, we can still use the corresponding uh, percentage of the doublet uh, expected to be found as the value for the third parameter so before uh, moving on uh, to demonstrating how to use doublet finder to predict doublets uh, these are some of the best practices so doublet finder cannot be applied to aggregated data or integrated data uh, doublet finder is supposed to be run as a qc step so it cannot be applied on aggregated or integrated data uh, it is also not preferable to run on merged data because uh, different samples in the merged object may contain different proportions of cells and uh, the merged object can be large in size which could be computationally intensive and could also uh, cause R to crash sometimes. Uh, so ideally doublet finder should be applied to each sample individually and it should be applied after the input data has been cleared of low quality cells and low quality clusters which consist of low RNA UMIs or contains high mitochondrial read percentages or uninformative marker genes. So once your data has been cleared of all of those uh, uh, uninformative or low quality cells or clusters uh, it should be run on each sample individually. For today's tutorial, I will be using four packages, uh, Doublet Finder, Surat, uh, Tidyverse and ggplot2. So now let's switch screens to our studio to get started. Before I start writing the code, let's download the data that we will be using today. So today I'm using a 10x genomics dataset. So this is their homepage and I'm navigating to the datasets page. And today we are uh, using this data set which is from uh, which is human peripheral blood mononuclear cells uh, from a healthy female donor and the libraries were generated from 16,000 cells and over 11,000 cells were recovered so I'm going to download this data today and I'm going to download the uh, raw features uh, feature and cell matrix so I'm going to get the raw counts and I'm going to save in my data folder this is going to get downloaded as dot uh, tar dot gz file so we need to uncompress this file so uncompressing this file when we do that we get the uh, raw feature um, matrix uh, folder within which we will have our feature file our barcode file and our um, matrix which has our counts so just taking a glimpse at the uh, folder contents we have these files now we can read uh, each of these files and uh, create a count matrix so let's go to our studio now let's read in the libraries first Now to read in the counts matrix we will use a function read matrix where we provide the path and the file name of the matrix file the features file and the barcodes file so i will just fill in these blanks here so This is the complete path to these files and the name of the file is matrix.mtx.gz so I'm just going to um, paste the paths first and then paste the name of the files And let's assign this to a variable called counts. Our counts sparse matrix has been created. So let's just take a glimpse at the matrix. Looking at the first 10 rows and the first 10 columns. We can see that this is a sparse matrix with rows as gene names and columns as the barcodes, the cell barcodes. So we have created our sparse matrix. Now let's uh, using this um, count sparse matrix, let's create a Serat object. So we can use a function called create serat object, provide this variable to the counts parameter and assign this to a variable name and emc.serat and now let's run this. A serat object has been created so let's just quickly take a glimpse at the serat object. 
we can see that it has um, properly created a serat object from the counts and we can see our counts data in the count slot. So now let's perform the QC and the filtering. Uh, again, in one of my previous video, I have spoken in detail about the QC steps and um, perform these steps in greater detail. So I encourage you to explore the QC. I'm not going to go into the details of the QC today. I will be filtering for um, mitochondrial read uh, cells having high mitochondrial read percentage. So I need to calculate percent feature set for my Serat object and counting for all the genes that start with MT and saving it to the metadata in the Serat object. I'm missing an equal to here and this should work. So now I'll directly perform filtering. So I will subset my Serat object and keep only those um, cells that has greater than 800 counts, transcript counts. And keeping only those cells that have greater than 500 genes and keeping cells having less than 10% of mitochondrial reads and saving this again to Serat or maybe I can create a new variable called Serat filtered and run this. Now that we have filtered our Serat object and removed cells having a uh, low number of transcript counts, low number of genes and uh, cells having higher percentage of the mitochondrial reads, let's just take a look at the cells that we started off with, the number of cells. So we had so many number of cells and after filtering, we are left with almost uh, over 10,000 cells. So we have significantly filtered out the low quality cells. After we filter our Serat object, next we need to pre-process our data before we run our doublet finder. So we need to run our standard workflow steps. So we start by uh, normalizing data first. Then we find variable features. After finding variable features, we scale data. And after scaling data, we run linear dimensionality reduction. Now let's find the dimensionality of our data set. So we can use elbow plot here. Zooming in on the plot. Uh, it seems that somewhere between 15 and 20 or until 15 majority of the variation has been captured but I'm going to use all the 20 uh, first 20 uh, principal components so we're going to find neighbors using first 20 dimensions saving it back to the object then we find clusters and finally we run umap using first 20 dimensions So we have finished running the pre-processing steps on our Serat object. So, so far we have read in the data, we have performed quality control and filtering, and we have performed um, pre-processing standard workflow steps. Uh, so these number of steps need to be performed before running doublet finder on any data set. Recall that we discussed about three parameters that doublet finder requires to make doublet predictions. Uh, the PN parameter, the expected number of doublets and the PK parameter. So the PN parameter is the number of artificial doublets and it's set to the default value of 0.25 or 25%. And it has been found that a doublet finder performance is not dependent on the PN parameter. 
the expected uh, the second parameter is the expected number of doublets and we can get this information from the uh, user guides of the reagent kits from 10x genomics and the third parameter is the pk parameter and it has been found that the doublet finder performance is highly dependent on the pk parameter and we need to um, find the optimal pk value so we will run the next few steps to find the optimal pk value uh, here I'm using the no ground truth strategy uh, to find the uh, optimal PK value. Uh, again, we have the cell multiplexing data available for our data, but most of the real data sets in the real world do not have that information. And hence, no ground truth approach to find the optimal PK value is more suited for real data sets. And hence, I will be following that approach to find the optimal PK value. Uh, so... The following steps are uh, are what I'm following from the um, GitHub page of the doublet finder. They have provided these steps and I'm just following those steps. So the param sweep function essentially introduces artificial doublets in varying proportions, merges with the real data set and uh, pre-processes the data set and uh, calculates the proportion of artificial nearest neighbors for varying neighborhood sizes. And it provides us a list of the proportion of artificial nearest neighbors for varying combinations of the PN and the PK. The summarize sweep uh, summarizes the results from the param sweep. And finally, the find PK value computes a metric by which we can find the optimal PK value. So it computes a mean variance uh, normalized by modality coefficient. And the highest value of that corresponds to the optimal PK value. So the following steps uh, we will be dedicating to finding the optimal PK value. So let's start by running these steps. This uh, will take a couple of minutes to run. So this is how the results from the parameter sweep looks like. So we have um, a proportion of artificial nearest neighbors for each combination of PN and PK. So in the next step, we summarize the sweep. And what we get is essentially um, metric calculated for each combination of PN and PK. And using this uh, statistic, we find the optimal PK value. So this generates a plot as well as it gives us a table that has various measurements of the mean and the variance of the bimodality coefficients. So I'm going to create a similar plot uh, with ggplot where I'm plotting the uh, PK value on the x-axis, the BC metric on the y-axis and so creating a simple line plot uh, similar to this. So I can see the values on the x-axis. So creating this plot and now zooming in. So the PK value corresponding to the highest uh, BC metric value is our optimal PK value. So in our case, 0.21 corresponds to the maximum uh, BC metric and hence our optimal PK value is 0.21. Here we are programmatically storing the optimal PK value to a PK variable. So we are using tidyverse here and we are filtering for the max BC metric and storing the corresponding PK value to the PK variable. Uh, this gets returned as a list. So we are uh, choosing the first value from the list and converting it to a numeric value and storing it into the variable. So here we have um, the optimal PK value stored into the PK variable. So now we have a value for PK, we have a value for PN. The only parameter that is left is the expected number of doublets and we get a, a estimate number from the user guides of the reagent kits uh, and we can calculate uh, expected number of doublets using the uh, number of cells loaded and the number of cells recovered. Uh, but we also need to model for the homotypic doublets and we can do that by using the model homotypic function which models the proportion of homotypic doublets based on the user provided annotations and here these annotations are cell clusters. So let's save these uh, annotations here. So from our Surat object we are using the from the metadata we are choosing the cell clusters and saving these annotations to the annotation variable. So for each cell, we would have the annotation as to what cluster they belong to. And then we use these annotations to um, model the homotypic doublets. So we get the proportions of the homotypic doublets. So we get some number here. The model, uh, the function has uh, modeled some proportion of homotypic doublets. Now, in the next step, um, we from based on the number of cells we had loaded and the number of cells we recovered, we expected somewhere 7.6% of doublets to be present. 
and we multiply that by the total number of cells in our uh, serat object and the value we get is the expected number of doublets and to adjust for the homotypic doublets we uh, multiply it by the um, value we get by subtracting the proportion of the homotypic doublets from one so we get this value uh, and we multiply that by the expected number of uh, doublets we found in the previous step and that is the expected number of doublets after adjust being adjusted for the um, homotypic doublets. So we can see that um, we expect around 761 uh, doublets to be present. These are the real doublets we expect to be present in our data. And after homotypic adjustment, uh, we, we expect 691 uh, doublets to be present uh, in our data. So now finally we run the doublet finder function and this is the core function that runs the doublet prediction. So we provide it with the object name or Surat filtered object. We uh, provide the principal components um, and the three parameters that we calculated. So the PN parameter, as I said, is set to 0.25. Uh, we found the optimal pk value so the we have our um, optimal pk value stored in a variable pk so we provide that and we provide the expected uh, number of doublets after homotypic adjustment these values are set to false because this is our initial doublet finder run and we do not have previously generated pann results and since we haven't used set transformed in our pre-processing steps we will set this uh, parameter to false and now let's run the function. The doublet finder function has finished running. So now let's visualize our uh, data as dimension plot. You will be able to find the doublet predictions in the metadata. So let's take a look at the metadata. We can find that there is a, a, a column added uh, and it has the uh, predictions for each cell as singlet or doublet. So I'm going to use this um, column to group by and visualize the UMAP. So just to get the names of the column. So I have the wrong Serat object name. zooming in on the plot so it seems that the majority of the data is singlet uh, and we have few clusters here which are doublets and uh, these need to be filtered out before we move ahead and uh, perform some downstream analysis let's get the number of uh, singlets and doublets So we can simply do table on the metadata on that column and it seems that we have identified 691 doublets and uh, or 9326 singlets. So these doublets need to be filtered out before moving ahead and performing any downstream steps. So that's all I had for today's video. Um, as always, I will be uploading my script to the GitHub and uh, adding the link to my GitHub in the description below. I will also be adding the link to the Doublet Finder GitHub where uh, I have followed, they have provided the steps which I followed today. So make sure you check that out. And if you found this video helpful and informative, please make sure to hit the subscribe button, like the video, share it and leave your comments under the comment section. Until next time, see you.